Oh, good morning, my friends and the family here at Friendly Hills Church. It's great to see you. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand and um, as we read God's word, uh, the children, I want you to let you all know you'll be dismissed for children's worship after the reading of scripture and the prayer, and then we'll dismiss you. If you will all stand together with me as I read from uh, the 14th chapter of Mark, beginning in verse 12. <clears throat> Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 12, I will be reading from the English Standard Version. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will uh, meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready there, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve, and they were reclining at the table and eating, and Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him and to one another, is it I? And he said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread in the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it and said, and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives together. This is God's word. Let's pray. Jesus, we ask that you bless to us the reading of your word and also the preaching, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable, O Lord, in your sight, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Children, if you want to make your way to the education building over here and follow Mr. Beck, you can make your way over to Children's Worship. Now you, I'm sure you all keep as careful track as I do of where we are on the Gospel Mark. Um, that's meant to be a bit sarcastic, but anyway, uh, we... You may have noticed we jumped ahead a little section there in the Gospel of Mark. We finished up chapter 13, and now we're supposed to be on chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. But seeing how this is Communion Sunday and seeing how this, neck, this passage here is Jesus' institution of communion and the Lord's Supper, I wanted to move ahead a bit and let's have a conversation with God's Word about what Jesus has done here in the Passover. And so um, a lot of what I'm going to say, I learned from a lady by the name of Stacy, who was a Messianic Jew. Uh, she attended our church up in Wisconsin. A wonderful, wonderful lady, saved in a miraculous way uh, to her new Yeshua, uh, her new uh, Mashiach, uh, Jesus, the Messiah. And um, she still celebrated all of the Jewish holidays. And so each holiday, we celebrated many of them with her. We celebrated Passover. We celebrated Shabbat or Sabbath with her. We celebrated Sukkot or the Festival of Booze. And we also celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And she explained it all as she went through that, and then which ends in Passover. So a lot of what I'm about to describe for you comes from her and from our experience in celebrating these Jewish holidays with her. <clears throat> so as we look at this passage, I want you to look at it through the eyes of a family. 
a family that is gathered together around the table and is celebrating the Passover and watch how Jesus changes it. So we're going to look at kind of the three movements here. We see the Passover prepared as the disciples go out to prepare for it, and we see the Passover interrupted as in the middle of the the meal, Judas stands up and leaves, and then we see the Passover interpreted as Jesus takes it and changes it. So let's take a look. Verse 12. And on the first day of the unleavened bread, they sacrificed the Passover lamb. His disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? So you notice that there are two things introduced to us here that most of us non-Jews have no idea about, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Pesach or the Passover. I've always thought of them as two separate holidays, but they actually are kind of the same holiday. It starts off with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it moves through and it concludes with the celebration of Passover. So I want you to notice here that the Feast of Unleavened Bread kicks it off. Mark instructs us that on the first day of Unleavened Bread, that there's a removal of all leaven from the home. So this is a true holy day. It's not just a holiday. There's a very conscious practice of the people wanting to engage God through this holiday, this holy day of unleavened bread. And so the removal of leaven symbolically in preparation for Passover means that all sin would be removed from the household. Now it's impossible to do that, of course, but what the practice of removing all leaven from your house does is it makes you very aware of the nature of sin. And so I want to talk about that for a little bit. As you remove leaven from the house, you you actually begin to understand three really key aspects of sin. That sin is invasive, that sin is pervasive, and that sin is addictive. So let's look at that. Sin is pervasive. Okay, so you probably think that on the unleavened bread, all you do is open up your refrigerator, look in the little drawer where the yeast packets are, okay, and you just take those out and you're good to go. But the truth is that you need to remove every single leavening agent from your house. Okay, so that includes eggs, yeast, baking powder, baking soda, acidic fruits, applesauce, believe it or not, is a leavening agent, buttermilk, sour milk, sour cream, any citrus and vinegar. And so you realize that there's a lot of things that act as leavening agents and that we use as leavening agents in our cooking that need to be removed from the house. And so you start thinking about all the things that have the, all the dishes and foods that have those leavening agents in it, and you start removing all those from the house, and you think, okay, what am I going to eat, right? So you understand when you clean all these foods out of your house that sin is like that. Sin is pervasive. Sin invades every single corner of our life, our thoughts, our emotions, our actions. Sin affects everything we think and feel and do. And the act of cleaning leaven out of your house doesn't clean all your sin out, but it makes you very aware of how pervasive sin is. All right, second, you realize that sin is invasive. Okay, so you can put a tiny little bit of yeast in batter or dough, and what happens? It spreads to the whole thing almost immediately. You put baking soda or baking powder in something, and suddenly it moves throughout the entire dough, and it spreads and it grows and it expands so that the bowl or the of batter or dough is suddenly filled. And you realize something about sin, that sin sort of sneaks into your life very small, but then it spreads and it grows and it expands. It feels like it's a small and unobtrusive at first, but pretty soon it's this big thing that carries out into all of your life. It invades and grows and expands. 
And then you realize that sin is addictive. When you start taking these things out of your house, you have to take out chip dip, you have to take out some cheeses, you have to take out the buttermilk pancakes, applesauce, yeast bread. And suddenly you say, I don't want to get rid of these things. I love these things. I'm a carb addict and proud of it. Right? That's what happens. You begin to realize how much you love these things, and you're not going to be able to eat them for a whole week, which really isn't that long, but when you start telling yourself, I can't eat all these things for a whole week, it seems like forever. And you begin to realize that you're addicted to these foods, that you want these foods, and it's hard for you to live without them. I remember our son, we were looking at uh, this array of, of muffins and in one little tiny corner of the breakfast nook, there were these muffins that had a label that said, no dairy, no sugar, etc. And so he read it out loud. He said, okay, no gluten, no dairy, no sugar, no fun, was his comment. That's very true. It seems when you have a very shallow view of life, that when you peel all of the sin away, when you get serious about that, that life is no fun. But the truth is, sin is addictive and pervasive and invasive, and it destroys your life. That as you let it grow and as you let it take hold, it's not fun after a period of time. It's destructive, it's painful, it's hurtful. And pretty soon, everything around you falls apart and you realize why it needs to go. And so what Jesus is helping us do here is he's helping us prepare in the Lord's Supper. Our hearts need to be prepared to come and celebrate together. We need to reflect on why our Lord died for us. 1 John 2, 2 says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sin, and not for ours only, but for the sin of the whole world. Our reflection upon our sin needs to understand that it's invasive and pervasive and addictive. And it's necessary for us to take it all into account and understand it. And then our eating and drinking of the body and blood of our Lord takes on an intimate nature. It takes on a familial nature, an intimate meaning for our lives and for the people around us. Because we understand now that we're connected in a way that we didn't realize before. We're connected through the body and blood of our Lord. And that none of us have hope apart from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So are you prepared? Have you taken into account this week your life? Have you really contemplated how much you are dependent upon Jesus Christ for his body and blood? All right, let's look at verses 17 and 18. The Passover interrupted. <clears throat> so it says here, and when it was evening, he came with the 12, and as they were reclining at the table, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. <clears throat> so it's sort of ironic that Mark, who's writing this a little after all of these events happened, probably based upon Peter's preaching, his mentor, Mark still refers to the disciples as the 12, because really they're only 11 at this point. They, everybody, or Mark already knows what's going to happen. Mark knows that Judas betrayed Jesus, and so it's interesting that he still calls them the 12. Technically, <clears throat> at this point, in the middle of this dinner, it's going to be, it's going to be pared down to 11. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing about Judas and the 12 disciples is that they were very diverse. There were people who were super spiritual, and there were people who were very unspiritual. You know, there were blue-collar workers like Peter and John, the fishermen, and then there was the white-collar worker like Matthew, the tax collector. There were uh, people who fit into polite Jewish society, and then there were people like Judas and uh, the other, Simon the Zealot, who were like crazy 
wacko right-wing Zionists. Okay, so we have this wide divergence of people and personalities here among the 12. And you can imagine if you have this diverse of a group, somebody's going to break, break rank. And Judas is the one who breaks rank. Judas is the one, they said in the Gospels, who carried the purse. He was the one that kind of kept the money and doled it out when people needed to go to McDonald's and get a snack or whatever along the road. He was the one that did all of that. And interestingly enough, and we'll talk about this a little bit next week, but I think what put him over the edge is what happens in the previous passage, where this lady takes this perfume that's incredibly expensive and is worth a lot of money and wastes it on Jesus. And Judas, who the passage, the gospels say was a thief, you know, he took a lot of that money for himself. He's thinking, dude, man, this is a lot of money. I could have like bought a lot of stuff. Okay, that's it. I'm out of here. I'm not part of this gang anymore. And so he decides to make his last uh, act as a disciple to betray Jesus and earn a few pieces of silver. So why is this not a Passover that Jesus is celebrating with his disciples here? Okay, Why is this not just a normal Passover? And this action in the middle, this betrayal by Judas tells us that this isn't just a Passover, this is the Passover. This is the Passover about to happen that all of the Passovers for the last 1,500 years have pointed. This is actually the Passover to which the initial Passover in Egypt was pointing to all along. You know, the initial Passover was just a small group of people in Egypt who are going to walk through the desert and be protected. This is a small group of people whom the angel of death will pass over. But now this points us to the Passover where Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, will provide a passage through the darkness of death for all the people of the world. This is the Passover to which all Passovers are about to point. And it's happening right here. Judas just simply sets it in motion. This is not so much an interruption as it is an activation of what the God had put in place from the beginning of time. And so Jesus now is, the first Passover, of course, was with its sacrifice. The innocent family pet lamb is sacrificed for the family's last meal, and it, be, it, it brings an appropriate amount of soberness to a thousand-year celebration of family and redemption. And now it points to Jesus, the innocent victim, who dies for the sins of the people. And Judas is simply a cog who sets it in motion by his betrayal. While the disciples prepare the Passover lamb, God the Father and God the Son had already prepared from time immemorial, the Passover lamb would be sacrificed this next day. Jesus, the Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Now, it's important to understand that although Jesus, Judas, by his betrayal, participates in what God has anticipated for centuries, he still faces the full responsibility and consequences of his actions. Look at verse 21. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Clearly this passage lets us know that we are responsible for what we think and do. That we have to take responsibility for our actions and for our thoughts and the things that we do. There is no blame shifting. There is no deflecting. There is no minimizing with God. He sees through it all. And the best, the best way to be in relationship with God, to be at home with God, to be able to celebrate around the table with God is simply to acknowledge our failures and our sins and face up to the responsibility and the consequences. 
There's a great divine irony here that the man who is betrayed here will offer all grace to those who trust in him and will give them the ability to face the consequences of their sin. Because Jesus, for those who trusted in him, took the woe upon himself so that we might have the blessing. All right, so we look in verses 22 through 25, and we see that Jesus explains the Passover, the Passover interpreted. Verse 22, and as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. So Jesus, in the main body of the meal, takes the unleavened bread, remember all leaven has been taken out of the house for a whole week, and he breaks the bread and then distributes it and pronounces a blessing something like this, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'alam ha'motzi lechem min ha'aretz, which basically means, blessed are you, O Lord, king of the universe who brings forth bread from the earth. Because the bread here isn't just a part of the meal, it actually has a symbolic nature. And that symbolic nature is actually explained for us in Deuteronomy 6.13. Here's what the verse says. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. You see, the unleavened bread here, or the Jewish name, matzah, symbolizes the affliction of the Hebrew people. But instead of Jesus saying the normal thing that you would say at Passover, this is the bread of our affliction. Instead, he changes it. He interprets it. He said, this is the bread of our affliction. It used to be, but now it's going to be the bread of my affliction which is for you. For it's my affliction that will provide redemption and salvation. It's my affliction that will provide you a way through the darkness. So now you can begin to see that there's a connection between the celebration of unleavened bread, removing all of the leaven from the house, focusing on the nature of sin and its invasiveness and pervasiveness and addictiveness, that Jesus is the only one who's perfectly unleavened. He's the one perfectly untainted by sin. He is the only one we can feed upon and not be polluted. He was the perfect sin-free body who was sacrificed in our place so that we might feed upon the sinless one and take the deepest spiritual nourishment possible that we might take into ourselves Christ through the sacrament of the supper and find that we are cleansed by his blood and his forgiveness in his body. That's why we call this a sacrament, because it's a symbol of something greater. In the Westminster Confession, the Shorter Catechism, it describes the sacrament this way. A sacrament is a holy ordinance instituted by Christ, wherein by sensible signs, Christ and the benefits of the new covenant are represented, sealed, and applied to believers. So here, through the common sensible element of bread, we experience the taste, the filling of Jesus, the covenant that he made with God, that his affliction stands in our place, that his blood, through his blood, he made an eternal covenant with God that stands forever because his blood was perfect and pure. We are filled with his peace and we partake physically in the covenant made on our behalf by Jesus. Okay, so this bread and wine does not give you superpowers. It's a common element. It's a sensible element, as the Westminster Confession says. This doesn't mean that the bread and wine turn magically into the body of Christ and magically do something for us. They, the bread and wine won't absolve you of sins or heinous actions on your part. 
this sacrament just simply reminds us and seals to us what Jesus has already done for us. It reminds us that what is most important is that we're united to Christ. And in Christ, in our united, unitedness with him, he's the one that changes us, that moves us, that forgives us, that absolves us, that makes us pure. Which is why we ask you, before you partake of communion, are you a believing Christian? Because the most important thing is that you believe in Christ. Because he's the one that does all these things. And the sacrament seals that into us in a very physical way. Now look at verses 23 through 25. It says, And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. So during the Passover meal, as you were sitting around the table, there are four symbolic cups of wine that are drunk. The first cup is the cup of sanctification. The second cup is the cup of deliverance. The third cup is the cup of redemption. And the fourth cup is the cup of praise. The first two cups, the cup of sanctification and deliverance, are drunk before the meal starts. So there's... Uh, parts of the liturgy of the meal that are, are set around those two cups and they're reminded and the people around the table are reminded of that. The last two cups are drunk after the meal. The third cup is drunk immediately after the meal, the cup of redemption. This is the cup that Jesus is referring to in the Passover. This is the cup that he reinterprets for his disciples and for all of us. Jesus says, this cup of redemption is in my blood, not the blood of the Lamb. My blood makes a covenant in which the darkness of death will pass over you and you will be ushered into God's presence of eternal light and life. This cup signifies the blood whereby God makes a covenant with his people that the angel of death will pass over forever. That's this cup, the cup of redemption that is now in my blood. So I want to think about how to apply that for a moment. A few days ago, I heard uh, a professor at Yale, uh, a Christian uh, intellectual from Croatia by the name of Miroslav Volf uh, speak, and he started with this question. Why did God create the world? And he went, you know, did that professor thing where he kind of keeps us in suspense and says, is it because of this? Is it because of this? And he, he goes on for a while. But then he answered his own question in a very beautiful way. He said, God created the world so that man and God might have a home together. What a beautiful way to put it. That man and God might have a home together and live together and talk together, and eat dinner together. That they may enjoy each other. But then, of course, we know the story. Man spoiled the home that God had made for both of them to dwell together, and so God made another way for God and man to, give together, to live together. He sent his son, Jesus, who was both God and man, where we could be drawn together in Christ that we might have our true home, that we might find our true peace, that we might find the meal that satisfies us completely with no dessert, or maybe it is dessert only, I'm not sure which. So let me uh, think about that with you for a moment. So there's one place in the entire country, in the, in the U.S. of A., that I feel more comfortable than anywhere else in the world. And that's where I grew up. It's a little town 72 miles north of Boise, Idaho, called Weezer. And yet every time I go back, it's a little different. Every time I go back, that home has moved a little bit further away from me. Even though I'm still comfortable there, even though I know many of the people, even though it's that one place that I feel at home it still keeps moving away from me. But as Tim Keller says as he talks about home, it never really was my home. 
even when I was there and experienced all of those things, there were still lots of things missing from my home. And what that tells me is that there is a true home for which my soul hungers. There is a place in which my soul will be completely at peace and at rest. Psalm 90 tells us where that place is. Psalm 90 says, Oh God, you have been our dwelling place from everlasting to everlasting. And what we find here as Jesus reinterprets the Passover is that he is our true home. The only place where we find that peace, that rest, that blessing, that comfort is in Jesus Christ himself. So now we are his body. And he lives among us. He lives in us through his Holy Spirit. We are the temple. It was interesting in that little exchange with Miroslav Wolf, one of the students stood up, stood up and said, well, what about the church? And he kind of like went on and on about it. Uh, he was a little skeptical about the church, but I'm not. The church is where we experience God and man living together. The church is his body, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And yes, it's not perfect, and yes, there's a long way to go, and yes, we will experience it to the full one day when Jesus comes back in bodily form and brings us all together, but this is the place where we experience God and man together, and this is the gateway. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper is the gateway into that home. That's where we eat and drink and remember that Christ is part of us. So here we are in this meal, drawing near to God. We're reminded that the elements of Christ's body, the, the body and the blood, were given and shed for us. We experience it in the taste of the bread and the wine, that God has drawn near to us and brought us in to make a home with us again. And we're reminded again that we're a family sitting around the table with God at the head, rejoicing in our home together. Let's pray.